Hi, this is week 7 of AP Physics and in this week we're going to go ahead and go over applications of Newton's third law. Let's get started. For our agenda, all Newton's third law for us today. Uh, lesson objective, students will be able to solve problems using Newton's third law. Let's get started. Applications of Newton's third law. When applying Newton's law, we are only interested in the forces acting on the object. For example, a crate being pulled on a frictionless surface will have three forces acting on it. Force of gravity will be one, force normal will opposite force of gravity, and force tension or force pull from the person pulling on that crate. Since it's frictionless, we have no force of friction, and here's a free body diagram. Here's force gravity, force normal, and force tension or force pull, whichever way you choose to label it. An object is said to be in equilibrium when all the forces are equal. So let's say that object is either not moving or moving at a constant velocity, then um, there's no acceleration, so it is in equilibrium, and all the forces, whether it be gravity and normal or tension and friction, they balance each other out so that they're zero, both in the x-axis and on the y-axis. So all the forces. So our net force is zero, we say that an object is in equilibrium. All right, for our first problem we're gonna go over in this section, problem number five, it's about forces acting on a train. It says draw a free body diagram for each car and provide an equation that relates to the horizontal forces when the train accelerates at A meters per second squared. So we're gonna want an equation for that. All right, so we're going to go ahead and solve this problem. They also give us the mass of the train. It is M1 is 1,000 kilograms, M2 is 2,000 kilograms, and M3 is 3,000 kilograms for uh, cart number one, two, and three, respectively. So those are our masses that we're given. All right, so we're going to start with the free body diagrams for each one of these. We're going to start from left to right. Since we have cart three on the left, we're going to start with that one. So this is my free body diagram of that cart. Now, forces acting on it, there's going to be three of them, and um, there's a force of gravity there, and uh, just as equal, we're going to put force normal and Fn, and these two arrows should be the same length. So there we have it. Now, this card is getting pulled only by force 3, so I'm going to put force 3 here. There we have it. That will be our first card. For our second card, it's a free body diagram of it. Notice that the mass is smaller. Our second card has a 2,000 kilogram mass compared to 3,000 for our third card. So now I'm going to draw a smaller force of gravity. Same thing for force normal. It's in the opposite direction. It is card two has force from card three on the towards the left side, and I draw them the same length, and so it is accelerating, they do say it's accelerating at A, then I'm going to put a, a longer arrow on the right hand side, that will be F2, so that will be the free body diagram, plus all the forces acting on cart number 2. Cart number 1, now that one is the lightest by far, let me move it over just a bit. All right, it has a mass of 1,000 kilograms, which is much lighter than the other two. So I'm going to go ahead and draw smaller arrows for force of gravity and force normal, because it's got smaller force acting on it. Uh, force uh, from the second card is also pulling on it, so I'm going to go ahead and put that F2, same magnitude, same length, and it is accelerating, so I'm going to put a longer arrow for force one, which is the engine who's pulling on the cars behind it. All right, so that'll be our free body diagrams for card number three, two, and one. All right, so that's it. Uh, on top of that, they also want an equation that relates to the horizontal forces acting on them. All right, so um, gravity and normal force, they're gonna cancel each other out. All right, let's start with um, an equation. It's gonna be for this one's going to be force equals mass times acceleration. And uh, let's label it correctly. It'll be force 3 for our third card, which they have it as an uppercase M. So I'm going to put that down, uppercase M times acceleration. Or I'm going to divide 
by m on both sides, so we end up with this formula for the acceleration of the third card. All right, next, for our next one, it'll be the second card. There are two forces acting on it. Force two towards the right, force three is working against us. So that's in the negative direction, so I'm gonna write it as so. Force two minus force three, it's equal to mass of card number two times its acceleration. And again, I'm just gonna divide by the mass on both sides, so this will be the acceleration of our second card. Let me label it for the second card. Now, these two values, although I put a, a different symbol on it for the third, for the second, it's the same acceleration for all three cards since they're all attached to each other, so therefore they're all accelerating at the same rate. Let's go ahead and get to this one right here. It's going to look very uh, similar to um, our second card. So for our first card, we have force uh, from the engine, force one pulling to the right, force 2 pulling to the left, so it's going to look like this, F1 minus F2, it's equal to the mass of 1 times acceleration, and again, that will be the formula for the acceleration. Um, I'm going to erase the symbols for them, because it might create the confusion that there's three different accelerations, but they're all accelerating at the same rate, and that's how you'll find it for the first card, second card, and third card. Okay, that takes care of problem number 5. Let's go ahead and move along. Problem number six, they piggyback on the same train and they ask you as the following, draw a free body diagram for the system if we pretend that uh, the third and second card are together and also a, second, a se separate problem, what if we pretend that uh, card number two and card number one were together plus provide an equation that relates to the horizontal forces when the train's accelerating at a meters per second squared. So similar, they're going to want an equation for that. Alright, so for this one, the free body diagram, let's start with when we think that uh, M3 and M2, both uh, card number 2 and card number 3 are together as one system. So this will be our free body diagram. Let me draw it a little bit lower. And in this case, um, it will be force 2 acting on it. We ignore force 3 because we are thinking of this whole card 2 and 3 as a system. So that's why we're not putting it in there. All right, their mass will be the mass combined of card 2 and card 3. So I'm going to go ahead and put much longer arrows for force of gravity and force normal. All right, so that will be our free body diagram. If our system were 2 and 3, they want an equation to go with it as well. It will look like this. Force 3 is equal to mass times acceleration, but the mass is of both cart 2 and cart 3. So I'm going to put M2 plus M3. And for the formula, I'm just going to move over the mass towards the denominator. And that will give us our acceleration if card number two and card number three are seen as a system, both put together. All right, next, let's go ahead and take a look at the next one. What if card two and one, so these guys instead, are seen as a system, as both together? What would the free body diagram look like? And uh, what will be the formula for its acceleration? All right, so here's our free body diagram, just a dot for it. Okay, and... Um, if card 1 and 2 are together, we still have two forces, force 3 and force 1. So I'll put force 3 here and force 1 over there. Um, let's see, that one weighs 1,000 kilograms, that one weighs 2,000 kilograms, it's 3,000 kilograms. So it won't be nearly as long as the other one, though that one was heavier, so I'm going to put shorter arrows. Oops. Force normal. Okay, on the horizontal forces, what forces are acting on it? Force 1 minus force 3. So it will be force 1 minus force 3. It's equal to the combined mass of the card 1 and card 2. So I'm going to put that down. M1 plus M2. Multiply times acceleration. And we're going to go ahead and move that over. So our formula will be this. 
and that will be the acceleration. And again, since they're all linked to each other, the acceleration will be the same for all. Okay, so that goes ahead and takes care of this problem. Up next for us, I'm going to go ahead and uh, point out this uh, table that is seen on the formula sheet for AP Physics 1. And in that formula sheet, they give you this. And these are the values for, let's say you put it to your calculators, sine of 30, it will be 1 over 2. Or sine of 37, it will be um, 3 over 5, and so on. And it's important to recognize those values as what they are. And um, let me get my calculator. If I were to do my calculator, let's do sine of 45. Sine of 45. So that gives me the following. Sine of 45 degrees is equal to 0.707. Now, let's say that you're solving a problem and the final answer is sine of 45. So you're looking in the answer sheet for 0.707. That's what you're looking for. But chances are that in the answer sheet, so you got solution A, B, C, D, they might have them in fractions and they are going to say, oh, it's A and they'll give you some answer, B some answer, C some answer. Let's say that B is square root of 2 over 2. See, like sine of 45 is square root of 2 over 2. And it's important for you to recognize that these two are the same number. Okay, if you put in your calculator square root of 2 divided by 2, it comes out to be 0 0.707. So I wanted to point out that sometimes they'll write the answer in the test as a decimal, but sometimes they'll leave it as uh, written out like with the radical uh, over 2. So it's important to recognize that these two are the same number, so that when you're looking for 0 0.707, and then you're like, that's odd, I don't see it there, I don't see it. Oh, reference this table, it's like, oh, sine of 45 will be square root of 2 over 2, or sine of uh, 60 is square root of 3 over 2, and so forth. So that way you can identify, oh, that's really what I'm looking for as opposed to 0 0.707. So just wanted to discuss that briefly. All right, let's go ahead and move on to our next example. Next for us, we're going to go ahead and go over example number two. In example two, they ask you, a traffic light weighing 1 times 10 to the 2 newtons hangs from a ver vertical cable tied to two other cables that are fastened to a support. The upper cables make angles of 37 degrees and 53 degrees as shown in the picture. All right, with the horizontal, find the tension on cable one, cable two, and cable three. All right, and um, let's go ahead and solve this problem. In this problem, we're gonna go ahead and some of the math, particularly with right triangles that you learned in your math class. We're gonna use sine, cosine, and uh, not tangent, but just sine and cosine. All right, so let's go ahead and get to work. The first thing I need to do is figure out the tension for T1 and T2. T3, by the way, the answer is, what's the tension of T3? It is 100 newtons. We got that, it's right there. The traffic light weighs one, uh, one times 10 to the 2 newtons, that's 100. So there's our first answer, T3 is uh, 100. Next, uh, here's one of our forces, T1. Here is the other one, T2. I'm going to go ahead and find the components for each one of these. So components, I'm going to draw some dotted lines, so we need that one, and we need that one as well. I'm going to erase this, I need it slightly out of the way. Okay, so we have our right triangle right here, and since these two lines are parallel, if that's six, uh, 53, this angle is also 53 as well. Alright, now for this one, I'm going to go ahead and call this one T2 on the y-axis, I'm going to call this one T2 on the x-axis. All right, next, let's go over to T1. Same thing, we want to go ahead and break down our diagonal line to its component, and that is a right triangle, and again, since both of these lines are horizontal, that's a 37, this will also be a 37 degrees. All right, I'm going to call this one T1 on the x-axis, and this one T1 on the y-axis. Alright, so now that we have that, let's go ahead and figure out what is the value of T1 on the y-axis, T1 on the x-axis, and then same thing for T2. We'll do those as well. Alright, so for let's start with T1 on the x-axis. Here's our angle. There is T1 on the x-axis. They are adjacent. 
over the hypotenuse, and T1 is the hypotenuse. So adjacent over hypotenuse, that is cosine. So it will look like this, cosine of 37, let's just label that theta 1 for the meantime, just so that makes our life a little bit easier. We'll plug in the value for it later. Cosine of theta 1, it's equal to um, adjacent, which is T1 on the x-axis, or the hypotenuse, which is T1. Alright, now I'm solving for T1 on the x-axis, so I need to get rid of T1, so I'm going to multiply both sides by T1, so it goes away, so I'm going to go ahead and erase it, T1, T1, they cancel out, I'm going to erase that, so it moved over here. For the other ones, uh, it's going to be very similar where I'm going to move the T1 or whatever T2 might be over here so I can get the answer. I, I just want what's T1 on the x-axis, that's what I'm really looking for. Alright, T1 on the y-axis, notice that here's the angle, there's Ty, it is on the opposite, so opposite over hypotenuse is sine, so it look like this, T1 sine of theta1, it's equal to T1 on the y-axis. Okay, next for T2, it's going to look very uh, similar. Uh, we're going to start T2 on the x-axis, that is a cosine because it's adjacent. So it's going to look like this, T2 cosine of theta2, it's equal to T2 on the x-axis. That's what that it represents. And lastly, T2 sine of theta2, it's equal to T2 on the y-axis because it's um, opposite over the hypotenuse, so therefore that's uh, the value for T2 on the y-axis. Alright, so that's our starting point. We got these, we're going to go ahead and use them quite a bit. Alright, now let's go ahead and take a look at what we also know. Some stuff we do know is that these two right here are opposites each other. So what will be the net force from the two tension forces on the x-axis? So it will look like this. T1 on the x-axis minus T2 on the x-axis as well equals zero, zero newtons. Because they are opposites each other and it'll be the same because they're on the x-axis. Okay. Now, uh, we're going to go ahead and modify this a little bit, move that over. So we're going to say, well, T1 is equal to T2 on the x-axis. So that's what we've got. All right. What's up next for us? Well, let's go ahead and start substituting these that we went through the trouble of getting. So here's our first one. T1 uh, times cosine of theta1, it's equal to um, T2 times cosine of theta2. Okay, so I want to go ahead and I want to go ahead and uh, get T1 all by itself. So I would divide by cosine of theta, so it end up looking like this. T1 is equal to T2 cosine of theta 2 over cosine of theta 1. Alright, let's go ahead and solve for that. Let me go down. I know what their value is at. It's cosine of uh, theta 2. Theta 2 is 53 degrees. And cosine of theta 1. Theta 1 was 37 degrees. So that will go right there. And uh, so I'm going to go ahead and keep on going with this, get my calculator, get their values. So it's going to be cosine of 53 is 0.602 and cosine of 37 gives me 0.798 or 99 if you round up slightly. So therefore our value is going to be 0.602 divided by 0.799 equals 0.753 and that's one of our first formulas that we're definitely going to use later on. Alright, so we got our first part right here. We know what theta, uh, tension 1 is. This is tension 2 multiplied times 0.753. Now, I, I ran out of space, so I'm going to go ahead and write that answer here. I know what T1 is. It's T2 multiplied times 0.753. All right, I want to erase this, little lack of space. Now, our next part, 
we're going to look at the y-axis for T1 and T2. All right, now they're both pointing up, and the only one pointing down is T3, which is has a value of 100 newtons. Okay, so we're going to say there, at that point, uh, T1 on the y-axis plus T2 on the y-axis is equal to 100 newtons. All right, so we're going to go ahead and make that statement. See, they're both going up in the same direction. That's why I'm adding them together. And that equals 100, which is T3 pushing down in the opposite direction. Okay, so now uh, I'm going to go ahead and substitute their values here for T1y, that is T1 sine theta. And uh, here we go, T1 times sine of theta 1 plus uh, T2 on the y-axis is T2 times sine of theta 2. Okay, and that equals 100 newtons. All right, to simplify this a little bit, I'm going to go ahead and put their values. Theta 1 was 37 degrees. Theta 2, it was 53 degrees. So I'm going to go ahead and put their values now. Sine of 37 gives me T1 times 0 0.601 plus T2 sine of 53 gives me 0.799. So that's the value of sine 53 and sine 37 right there. All right, now we're going to go ahead and deliver a substitution. Do you know what T1 is? Right there, sure we do. We got it, that was our first section. T1 equals that. T2 times uh, 0.753. So I'm going to get that, substitute it right here where that is, the T1 is at. Alright, so that will be our problem. Now notice, what? why do that step? Because now we have T2, now we have one single variable that we're solving for, so that makes our life simple. As opposed to here we have T1 and T2, two different variables, so we only wanted one variable that was missing. So now at this point we're going to go ahead and multiply both of these together. Uh, so it's going to be 0.753 multiplied times 0.601. And that gives us T2.453 plus T2.799, that equals 100. All right, now we're going to go ahead and combine like terms. These two are the same. So I'm going to add them together. So that's going to go ahead and be 0.453 plus 0.799. It's going to go ahead and give me T2 times 1.252 equals to 100. Uh, last step to solve for T2 is going to go ahead and give me, just divide both sides by 1.252. So 100 divided by that is going to go ahead and give us 79.9 newtons. So there's tension 2. Alright, so we got that value, 79.9. What are we going to do now to solve for tension 1? I'm going to plug it here and get myself tension 1. I'm a little bit out of space, I'm going to erase this, we're all done with it. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite my formula. T1 is equal to T2 multiplied times 0.753. I'm going to substitute the value of T2, which is 79.9 here, and then multiply, and that's going to give us a value of T1. T2 is 79.9. Multiply times 0.753. So T1 equals 60.1 newtons. Alright, folks, so there's tension 1, tension 2, and tension 3 was 100. That takes care of example number 2. In problem number seven, they ask us a follow-up question to the previous problem about the light hanging from two strings. They say, how would the answer change if, the sec if a second traffic light were attached beneath the first? 
So if we were to double tension 3, well the answer to that, that would double tension 1 as well as double tension 2. So that will be the answer to this problem. Let's go ahead and move on to the next one. In sample problem number 8, they ask the following. Suppose the traffic light is hung so that the tension in T1 and T2 are both equal to 80 newtons. Find the new angles uh, they make with respect to the y-axis. And both angles are equal. So let's start with a quick drawing of that. Both angles are equal. We don't know what they are. So we have a traffic light. We want to know what the angles are. They're both equal, but we do know that the tension for 1 and 2 uh, is 80 for each. And we only really need to look at one of these. All right, and uh, so that will be the tension there. And what we really want is the angle. Okay, so I'm going to put a theta equals question mark because that is what we're looking for. All right, we do have the 80, which is the hypotenuse right here. And uh, we do have the weight of the light. Remember the light, T3, was 100 newtons. All right, if both of these have the same angle, therefore they are both holding the same force. Okay, so how much is that for one cable and the other? That would be 50 for this cable, 50 for that cable. That is a uh, force on the y-axis. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and put the components. So this value right here, that will be 50 newtons for that one on the y-axis. All right, so the angle is what we're solving for. Again, and uh, these two are congruent, they are the same, since both of these lines are horizontal. All right, so we're going to go ahead and solve for this. So the angle O will be um, opposite of our hypotenuse, that will be sine. So all we would need is sine of theta is equal to opposite, which is 50, over the hypotenuse, which is 80. And uh, if once we get that answer, that's going to go ahead and give us our final answer for this. So it's going to be uh, 50 divided by 80. That's going to go ahead and give us 0.625. All right, and to get the angle, we need to get inverse of sine. So our answer is going to be 38.7 degrees. Alright, so that is our answer for this problem. If both of them are the same, that really simplifies the problem quite a bit. Alright, so let's go ahead and move on to our next problem. And up next for us is example number three. In this problem, they ask you as the following. A sled is tied to a tree on a frictionless snow-covered hill. If the sled weighs 77 newtons, find the magnitude of the tension force, Ft, exerted on the rope on the sled and that of the normal force Fn exerted on the hill by the sled. Alright, so I'm going to start this uh, with a drawing. That will hopefully get us to visualize this problem a little bit better. So we have our tree here and we have our sled, not to scale, and it is tied to the tree. Alright, so they want to know a couple of things. Number one, what is the force FT force tension, the tension on that rope. How much force is there on that rope? All right, and the second one, they want the force normal that the hill is putting on the sleigh since it does have a weight of 77 newtons. Now, the drawing for the vector for the force normal is going to be perpendicular to the hill. The length of it, truthfully, I'm not sure yet. Might go back and redraw that arrow in a bit. All right. Now, uh, they also tell us the force of gravity. Force of gravity is acting on the sled, so it's going to be like so. Force gravity, which has a value of 77 newtons. Okay, so uh, those are the values that are given to us, and uh, let's go ahead and uh, start solving this. The first thing I want you guys to notice is two things. Force normal, like I said, is perpendicular to the hill and it will always be drawn that way. Force normal is always perpendicular to the surface. And force gravity is always straight down. Now we're going to break down the force gravity into its components. So the X and Y components. And force gravity will be the hypotenuse of this right triangle we're going to draw. So here is our first vector. 
Here's a second vector, I'm sorry, there's a component for our force gravity vector, and that makes a right triangle. Uh, not written here, but if you look really closely on the picture, you'll notice that the angle is 30 degrees. So that's going to be 30 degrees. Okay, and uh, let's call this one force gravity on the y-axis, and this one force gravity on the x-axis. Alright, so those are their values. And again, force gravity has a value of 77 newtons downward. Alright, so that's negative. Alright, so let's go ahead and get to work on uh, solving these two. Alright, now, actually before I get to solving, I want to point out this. Force of gravity on the Y, okay, the magnitude, the length of this component, okay, is the same as force normal. So whatever big that is, oh, I ran out of board. But yeah, that's about right. Those two lines are the same magnitude. Opposite direction, but same magnitude. So when we solve for the value of force gravity on the y-axis, that's going to answer our first question, question, which is, what's the force normal that the sleigh is putting on the hill? The next one is force tension is going to be the same as force gravity. Since this is not moving, it's going to have a net uh, force of zero, so all the forces are bouncing out. So once we solve for the force gravity on the x-axis, that's going to give us the force tension, and that's our second answer. So that's our strategy to solving this problem. We need both of these values. All right, so let's go ahead and solve for them. All right, so it's going to be, uh, let's see, let's start with force gravity on the x-axis. How do you solve for that? It'll be sine of theta, which is 30 degrees, is opposite over the hypotenuse, which is opposite is force of gravity x over force gravity. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and multiply by force gravity on both sides. And they cancel out, so I'm going to erase them. So there we have it. Force of gravity on the x-axis is um, sine 30 of force of gravity. Sometimes I've seen that they replace force of gravity with mass times gravity because you guys know force gravity equals mass times g. So I see that quite a bit. But we're not going to do that in this problem. I just wanted to bring that up. That's force gravity. Alright, now that we have that, let's go ahead and plug in their values. So it is going to be 77 newtons times sine theta equals force of gravity on the x-axis. Alright, so put that into my calculator. So it's going to be negative 38.5 newtons. That is force of gravity on the x-axis. Alright, so notice though the way my arrow is pointing to the left. So if force of gravity on the x-axis is equal to force tension, but force tension is going the opposite direction, what's going to be the value of force tension? It's going to be, uh, let's see, force tension is equal to positive 38.5 newtons. So there's our force tension. Next, let's go ahead and solve for force normal. In force normal, we're going to have Fn will be equal to force gravity on the y-axis. Alright, so I'm going to, let's see, look at the angles, see they are adjacent. So what do you do adjacent? And we have the hypotenuse that is cosine. So I'm going to say cosine of 30, it's equal to force gravity on the y-axis, because it's adjacent, over the hypotenuse, which is force gravity. Alright, I'm going to multiply by force gravity on both sides, as I did before. That is gone. So I'm going to go ahead and erase this because they cancel each other out. So there's the value of force gravity on the y-axis. It is force gravity times cosine 30. Okay, let's put in the value, 77 newtons times cosine of 30. So the answer for that is 66.7 newtons. And that is in the negative direction. Uh, notice that this vector arrow is pointing down, force normal is pointing up, so therefore our answer for force normal is going to be positive 66.7 newtons. Alright, so that will be our answer for 
force normal and force tension for this problem. Let's go ahead and move on to the next problem. The next problem they ask you guys the following question. Consider the same scenario on a hill with a steeper slope. Would the magnitude of the tension force on the rope get larger, smaller, or remain the same as before? What about the normal force? The steeper it gets, the larger this value becomes, the angle. Okay, so the larger the angle becomes, therefore, the larger the value. So, for force tension, the steeper it becomes, the higher the force tension. That would increase. Okay, and... Um, for force normal, that one would decrease. Now, it's nice to talk about it, but it will be better if I give you an illustration. What if I were to draw this with a much, much steeper uh, angle? Alright, so there's our tree, there's our sled, there's our rope. Alright, now force gravity, I want to draw it with the exact magnitude, so I'm going to do my best. So. That would be it. Now, I want to draw a right triangle. Notice the lengths compared to the, the picture on the left. Uh, I'm assuming I drew force gravity the same length, more or less the same length. But notice what happened to force gravity on the y-axis. It became smaller compared to the original, see? Much smaller. So therefore, force normal, it would also be smaller. What happened to force gravity on the x-axis, it got longer compared to the original. So, therefore, this one would also be longer, force tension would be longer as well. Alright, so the steeper it gets, force tension becomes greater, force normal becomes smaller. So that will be the answer to this problem. Let's move along. Next problem, number 10. In this one, they ask you, suppose that a child of weight W climbs onto the sled. If the tension force is measured to be 60 newtons, find the weight of the child and the magnitude of the normal force acting on the sled. Alright, so I'm going to go ahead and write down some values. We know that uh, the sleigh has a grand total, the force of gravity, just because of the sleigh is, weighs a total of, I'm sorry, 77 newtons. Okay. Now, they're also telling us that uh, now the force tension is equal to 60 newtons. So this is from the previous problem. We know that that's the force due to gravity of the sleigh. All right. So they want the weight of the child. All right. So we're going to go ahead and solve that. Same hill, by the way, 30 degrees. So I'm going to go ahead and give you guys a very similar drawing as much as I can. All right. So here we have our tree again and uh, the sleigh. But this time, there's a child sitting on it. There's a rope. And uh, this time, they told us force tension. We have it. The value of that vector right there is 60 newtons. Force tension. All right. So, squeeze that in here. 60 newtons. That's the value. See, force tension is that. All right. So, we also know that... Um, force gravity, well, we're going to solve for that. So here's force gravity, there's our components right there. Okay, for this one, remember that the angle was 30 degrees. So for force gravity on the y-axis, and it is going to be, from the previous problem, we know that that's going to go ahead and be force gravity times sine 30. I'm sorry, that's adjacent, so it's not sine. It's cosine. For force gravity on the x-axis, now that's opposite, so that one is force gravity times sine of 30 degrees. Alright, so those are the values. Now, what do we know about force gravity on the x-axis and force tension? We have mentioned earlier that they have the same magnitude. So could I plug that in right here? Sure I could. Alright, so it's going to be 60 newtons. It's equal to force gravity times sine 30. So 60 newtons, it's equal to um, 
let's see, force gravity times sine 30. Put into your calculator, sine 30 is 0.5. I'm going to divide by 0.5 on both sides. And that goes ahead and gives us 120 newtons. All right, so in this scenario, it's uh, 120 newtons. All right, that's the force gravity of the child and the sleigh. Now you might be wondering, what about the 77? No, that was just the sleigh only. All right, this is both the child plus the sleigh. So how would I get the force gravity just because of the, just the force gravity of just the child alone? All right, so that would be 120 minus the 77 newtons. Okay, and since that's the child and the sleigh put together, minus the mass of the sleigh, 43 newtons, and that will be the force just due to the child. So this one was force gravity of both, let's put sleigh and child. This is force gravity of just the child. That's what we're looking for. And we took away the force gravity of the sleigh. All right, so 43 newtons. That would be the force gravity of the child only. So that'll be his weight. All right, next. Uh, they also wanted to go ahead and give us the normal force. Normal force is opposite the force of gravity on the y-axis. Now, you do know what the force of gravity is, right? Force of gravity is 120. So I can go ahead and plug that in right there. So it'll be 120 uh, times cosine of 30. So cosine of 30 times 120. That'll be, round it up slightly, 104 newtons. So that'll be your force normal. Um, for this problem, well, that would be the child plus the sleigh will give us a force normal of 104 newtons. Okay, so that goes ahead and takes care of this problem. Let's go ahead and keep on moving. All right, on the, our next problem, problem number 11, they ask you the following question. Uh, problem 11 says, for the woman being pulled forward on the toggle band, uh, if the magnitude of the normal force exerted by the ground on the toggle band is equal to the weight of the woman plus the, the toggle band, greater than the total weight or less than the total weight. All right, so let's go ahead and do a free body diagram on that one. And the question uh, is, the normal force would be the same, more or less. Let's do a quick free body diagram. Uh, forces acting on the woman and her little sleigh. It is force gravity, right? All right, there is uh, it's ice, so uh, there's some friction even on ice. All right, and the mass pulling, so I'm going to put force pull. I'm going to break the force pull into its components. So it'll be force pull on the y-axis, force pull on the x-axis. I'm not too concerned on the friction, not to worry about that. What they wanted to know is, what is the force normal? Now the force normal plus the force pull on the y-axis, do you see how that's an upward arrow? The force normal and the force pull on the y-axis added together need to add up to the force of gravity because it, there is no movement on the x-axis, so therefore it's an equilibrium. So therefore, let's say that that's about 10 inches and that's about 4 inches. So therefore, my line would be about 6 inches. That would be my force normal. Notice that it's smaller than the force gravity. If you add up this arrow plus that arrow, that would equal in magnitude to this other arrow. All right, so the answer would be C, less than the total weight. All right, that goes ahead and takes care of this uh, session. And thank you for watching.